dear Top Dog, and Top Dog I mean President, CEO, Owner, Executive Director. If you're the top dog, so to speak, of your organization, you at the top of the pinnacle, the buck stops with you, you set the overall vision, you build consensus with your team, which most good leaders do. But at the end of the day, the speed of the leader determines the speed of the pack. And I'm going to talk to you very quickly about something that is on my mind a lot right now, which is your employees and their well-being. And what I've noticed talking to easily over a hundred C-level executives in the last 18 months from all industries, all sizes, all areas of the country. What I see is everyone has a big problem, usually the number one or number two or three problem, which is finding good employees, finding great talent. And once you find the great talent, retaining the top talent, because whether you realize this or not, the number one asset of your organization isn't your building. It isn't your trucks. It's not your fancy logo that your cousin designed. It's not your website. It's your people. If you think about your number one asset being your people, then it changes your mindset and philosophy when it comes to how do you attract really great people? Because I'm here to share with you an idea that you might have already thought about, but you're not really acting on it. You're not taking the necessary steps to create the change that you're looking for. And I know that because I talk to you. I talk to executive directors at nonprofits. I talk to owners of companies. I talk to CEOs. I talk to people that manage a team of 12 people. And I talk to people that manage a team of 600 people. And the problem seems to be the same. So I guess I'm here to give you a little straight talk if you're open to it, if you can handle it. And I think you can because leaders of organizations are tough. You don't want sugar coating. You don't want silver bullets. You don't want bullshit. You want the truth because the world we're living in now demands big action, some bold moves sometimes, but more importantly, confidence and conviction that you're doing the right thing. And I'm here to give you that confidence and conviction because I see it all the time. Every week when I talk to people, I see the same problem coming up essentially on every call, on every meeting. And here's what I would suggest. I would suggest that you take a pause when it comes to your non-cash compensation. What do I mean by that? This is not your salary level. These are your benefits. And your benefits come in two different buckets. You have healthcare benefits and you have retirement or investment benefits. And there's this interesting dynamic when you look at both buckets together, because so many organizations look at one or the other in silos. And what I've come to realize after meeting some amazing people that focus on the other bucket, which is the investment, the 401k bucket. That is not something that we do. We are exceptional on the healthcare side as a boutique agency. But what I've learned is that there's an amazing dynamic when you combine those two strategies at the same time. What do I mean? Imagine you get an increase on your healthcare and for whatever reason, you're not open to any changes other than take the renewal increase from one of the big companies. And that increase is going to cost the company $50,000 or the organization or nonprofit. And in that same time, when we evaluate your 401k plan, we see that you have a company match and that company match for a year equals $20,000. So wouldn't it make sense if you're trying to offset a $50,000 increase in total by looking at both buckets, you see, if you look at both buckets, one strategy perhaps 
as an option, one of many that we talk about. But a simple example is what if we stopped the company match for one year and we told the employees that we're going to stop our 3% match or 4% match or 5% match. They can continue to contribute. But for one year, we're going to suspend that because we're going to take that money and we're going to offset the increase that we just got. And you're not going to have to pay any more for your benefits this next year. Your costs will not go up. The typical 10 to 25% that we're seeing now. We, the organization, will absorb the other $30,000 increase. And the other thing we will not do is we will not play the game that we see so many times called cost shifting. Essentially, instead of taking the 20% increase, you take a 10% increase for crappier benefits. And you explain it away in your meeting that you're so good at negotiating with the insurance carriers. And what you find when you look at the benefit changes is that you've messed up the pharmacy plan and coverage to the point you've shifted all that cost into the employee's checking account. You feel like a hero. You're like one year down. Wow. Now, okay, let's go back to business and do this another 12 months from now. Your broker feels good because they retain the business. But what did you actually do? You screwed your employees. That's the truth. And looking at these things in together versus two buckets is one example of how you should be thinking. And when I bring this up, most C-level or owners or presidents or executive directors say to me, wow, why have I not ever heard of this before? And I just smile. Just because you haven't heard of something before doesn't mean it's not true. What does it mean? It just means you haven't heard about it before. If you want to have a different conversation, one that's not full of pressure, sales pitches, silver bullets, and pie in the sky over promising, then reach out to us. Millingroup.com is our website. There you can learn about us. You can get some information. You can connect and ask questions. And if you're so bold, you could have a phone call with me, John Millen, one of the original founders, managing partner, and I call myself a benefit hacker because I'm tired of the status quo. I'm tired of seeing employees getting hosed. I'm tired of seeing corporations and nonprofits continue to shell out millions of dollars more than they should to the big five insurance companies and watch their profits and their revenues skyrocket on the backs of your greatest asset, your employees. I welcome you to have a different conversation, but I will warn you, this will not be a typical conversation that you're used to because I don't fill my conversations with fluff or pleasantries, although I'm very nice. I fill it with hard questions. Why are you doing this? Why are you doing that? Whose idea was that? And it can be a little bit uncomfortable not for me, but for you, because no one's ever asked you that hard question because you're the boss and they're afraid of you and they don't want to upset the apple cart. So they keep their questions simple and they do whatever you say. And that's what a broker is. What I'm suggesting is you fire your broker or keep your broker and get an advisor because an advisor will tell you what you have not heard before recommend things that you've never thought before and will go on that journey with you by making the decision together. The alternative is a series of spreadsheets every year, putting off the inevitable bad news that comes and hoping things will get better. If you'd like a different conversation, I welcome you to check us out.